So for those that aren't familiar, let me, let me start with a little bit of a um, background on the service and why we got into this space. So since I like people lifting their hands up, how many people have heard of programmable web? Oh, wow. I think that's like one person. Two, yeah, a few. OK, so that's interesting. So programmable web has been around now for like six years, something like that, founded by a guy called John Musser. It is a public repository um, of APIs, like a gallery. Anyone who has an API that you sell or you let people use for free, you can go there and register that API. Um, and in, in, in circles where people talk about the API economy, somewhere where I kind of live and breathe right now, so I, I work on the API management service, um, people are really into this product. It's a great way to go and find. Let me give you an example. You guys decide you want to integrate weather into your application, right? A great place to go and find where weather services are. Well, you go to Bing first. Of course, you know, but a great other place to go and find out where uh, weather services is programmable web. Hit a search, they'll come up with lots and lots of different APIs. You can go and explore them. So what's interesting here is the growth trend that these guys have seen has been um, exponential. You know, it's been it's been huge, and this takes us up to 2013. And uh, effectively, if you extrapolate this, the growth continues at that very very steep rate. So you see this enormous growth in the number of public APIs. The secret that everybody at the integration conference knows is that these public APIs that people sell and that um, are available for people to go and play with are really the tip of an iceberg. You guys all know that underneath that is this behemoth of private APIs that are specific for partner-to-partner -partner relationships and internal APIs that are used by businesses. Um, I was chatting to someone at Microsoft IT recently. They have so many APIs that they, they can't even begin to count them. You know, it's literally thousands and thousands of APIs internally. Um, and trying to use them, actually, if, I, if there's a day where I think, I'd really like to get to that data that would tell me about um, uh, how many product keys are generated for something. That would become a mission that would take me so much time. I might eventually find an API. I then might track down a guy who sort of owns this now. He might be able to send me an email document that's you know, very out of date, isn't very good, and then struggle through and use the API. Sound familiar? Couple of nods. OK. Um, so so this, this importance of APIs is obviously one of the reasons we got into this market with Azure API management. But I think the big thing we've seen that's really started to change, I'm interested to see your guys' uh, reflection on this, is how partnership is becoming industrialized. Um, when I used to work in industry, I worked at the UK's largest travel consolidator. And uh, one day, our board decided that we would partner with a rival. And the two boards came together, and there was a big contract negotiation. And the idea was that we would resell our flights through their website. And there was some sort of contractual revenue sharing model. And so we then set about forming a dev team that would build the API and manage the integration. It was a very long, drawn out process. And then we move forward to this sort of internet era now that we're in. And we see how that's changed, where anybody in this room could go to, say, developer.uber.com and go and become a partner with Uber in a flash. You don't even need to be a business. You know, Just as an individual, you can decide, I'd really like to integrate some functionality from OpenTable or from uh, Uber or from Walgreens into my application. And you can do, just go to their website, sign up, you'll get awesome API documentation, and you'll be away and, and running in a, in a matter of minutes. So this idea of partnership becoming more industrialized is really what API management um, is about. And so this is why we've entered this space. We're seeing this huge growth in APIs. We're seeing this huge increase in businesses trying to actually operate through an API. So if you look at the SaaS ecosystem today, we see a lot of businesses that use APIs as the, effectively the retail channel. The, their API is to them as a high street store is to um, Gap over in Redmond. You know, this is how they're actually going to transact and do business. I'll just throw some examples out, like Twilio, obviously, is a business that does uh, telecoms, but does it through an API and made it super easy. So we see a huge increase in, in various business models that are based around APIs. We see a lot of interest from enterprises that want to um, improve the way they are internally agile and provide access to their own data. And again, it all comes down to APIs. So the minute you decide that this is sort of a problem you want to go tackle or you want to have a, a business that, um, 
that operates around APIs or you want to increase your internal agility, you suddenly face um, a number of challenges. Um, let, me, let me run through these here now. So uh, I think the first one, uh, how many folks consider themselves developers in the room? Yeah, a lot of hands, right? So, so you guys will know that you're particularly fussy about documentation. You want great docs. It's awful when you go to an API and the docs aren't good, you know, and you struggle through and it takes a long time to get going. Worse still, when you do struggle, how do you engage with the person offering the API? How do you give them feedback or ask them questions or tell them what's wrong with their API or what you like about it? You need a bi-directional channel. Creating this kind of experience is non-trivial. You know, not everybody wants to go and spend time on building out some sort of uh, MSDN-like documentation center and engagement forums. What you really want is some kind of turnkey solution to help with that. Um, as as the, this API economy has become so sophisticated now that there are measures that people actually look at to sort of judge their success. And uh, there's one called the TTFC, or the Time to First Successful Call. And this is a measure of how long it takes from a developer deciding he wants to try your API to actually invoking it successfully for the first time. And the shorter you make that time, the more successful your API is likely to be, because they're less likely to go to a competitor or a rival. You're just giving a great experience. It's about, it's about that developer joy. And there are tools you can employ um, to help with that. Um, another example, how, how do you enforce business policy? So let's imagine you're going to sell your API. You're going to package it up and you say, we have a free trial that lasts for one month and then it automatically expires at the end of that month. We have a starter package that includes 100 API calls per month. And we have a super uber premium package that includes a million API calls per month. All of this quotering and subscription expiration is, is non-trivial legwork that is unrelated to the core problem you're trying to solve. You know, if you're Twilio, you're trying to solve the problem of telecoms, not of quotering APIs. And so just like Gap in the, the example I gave in the retail store over on the high street wouldn't go and build their own stock management system, you know, a smart business isn't going to go and build their own API quotering system as well. Um, uh, another thing that is a concern for anyone wanting an API program, we see a lot of large enterprises doing business in the space. They already have tons of data and services, you know, typically spewing XML over the wire, that aren't really suitable for projecting a modern developer-friendly API. If you're an iOS developer, consuming XML is, is no fun at all. You really want to be consuming JSON over HTTP. So how are you going to quickly, rapidly project a modern API over your legacy API. Um, how are you going to understand the behavior? Let's imagine you're about to launch a marketing campaign on a website. You're going to set up an Azure website, deploy some awesome content that sells your new product food. It would be unthinkable that you didn't plug in analytics to that. Right? You, you would have to plug in an analytics solution so you know how well that campaign is going, where the traffic is coming from, how long the pages take to load, etc., etc. Your API is really no different. You need, you need those insights, you know, which API operations are the most popular? Uh, am I having any errors that I should be worried about? Is my caching strategy working? Am I actually effectively using the, the caching capability? Uh, am I uh, seeing response time increases over time? Which developers are bringing the most traffic to me from those that have signed up? Um, and then I think finally, and I have a, a story about this as well, how do you protect your core business systems? So if you remember, I told the story of um, <clears throat> when I worked at a Travel Consolidator in the UK, and we did this partnership, and I built an API, our uh, heady days, Visual Studio 2005.net 2. I was so excited about generics, I remember it clearly, um, using Wizbill and SOAP. Um, and um, we launched it. It was very successful for a week. And then our partner, uh, I assume because they were using Java, um, had a bug in their code. And it triggered a for loop. And this for loop then started DOSing our system. And they actually brought down my API. They not only brought down my API, they brought down all the mission critical systems inside our business that brought down our website. We actually brought down a central flight database of a, of a, um, a very large organization in, in uh, somewhere in Europe as well. So it was a bad day. Let's just, let's just leave it at that, right? <laughs> uh, I got called in, I had to go and fix it. What was the first thing I did? I went and built a rate limiting system that said, you guys can't just party on with this. You, know, you, uh, you, you, you get much less rights in terms of the amount of traffic you can push through the system than we do, because we're, we're more worried about our own business than, than this part of the 
Likewise, I want to make sure that one rogue partner doesn't give a bad experience to, to another partner. So all of these capabilities are really turnkey capabilities that we provide in the Azure API management solution. So that's what, these are sort of some of the things that we think of as being um, part of uh, what API management tries to tackle. Make sense? Um, just again for those that aren't familiar, and I'm sorry for those that are, I know, I know a few of the guys in the room will be deeply familiar with this already. I have the donuts of death. I'm not asking a lot, I just want to go to the next slide. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And that concludes the demos for today. <laughs> so what I was about to show you, PowerPoint willing, was a, uh, was a very quick sort of logical overview of API management. We're pretty short on time. I only have uh, 30 minutes. I want to make sure I don't run into Carol's time. And this is really, this is really to feed awareness to folks in the team, uh, sorry, folks in the, in the, in the audience, um, about the existence of this product. So I'd encourage you to go and learn more uh, on our website. Let me find that slide quickly and see if it will present. Um, so here we go. Right, so, so API management is comprised of three pieces you see down in the center here. There is the publisher portal. That's where the guy who owns the API comes to decide he wants to, to publish the actual API itself. Um, he configures, by entering metadata, a developer portal, which has documentation about the API that looks awesome and is automatically generated. It also includes an interactive console that allows the developer to try the API in real time. So that's how you reduce that time to first successful call. Imagine having an auto-generated experience that allows the API on your website to play with that API. It's an awesome experience when it comes to learning how to use an API. And then we have uh, those developers go and build maybe apps, or maybe they build um, uh, you know, services that communicate with your API. Rather than go directly to your existing backend, which is this thing over on the, the right here, um, they actually go via our high performance proxy. So that proxy is where the magic happens. It's where we can do things like projection. So we have policies that can change the behavior of an API, make XML turn into JSON, just, at the, just with some configuration. We can do rate limiting and quota enforcement. Developers that sign up at the developer portal have an identity that then they map onto their application. And we can check that the application that's coming through our system is actually valid. We actually recognize it as an application because we give it a subscription key. And that's how we can do rate limiting. So we can rate limit each individual subscription that, that the developer has. That calls the API at the back end. And that API can be hosted anywhere. So it can be hosted on premises. It can be hosted um, uh, in Azure, which we love you for. But it can be hosted on the uh, rival cloud as well. I mean, there is no sort of uh, predicate to where that API is. As long as we can talk to it over HTTP, we're friends with that API and we love it. So the service has been, so I'll give some content quickly for the folks that are familiar with the service already. We, we launched the service into preview in May this year. We launched at TechEd in uh, North America. And uh, just for interest, the service is actually the result of an acquisition. We bought a company back in October called Tiffany um, that we, we turned into an Azure service. Um, and then we GA'd the service in September, so moving extremely quickly. And since then, you know, these are some of the features that we've added. Um, static IP, so that you can lock down your firewalls or only trust the specific servers the API proxy lives at. Um, we added OAuth 2 support, which I'll show you in just a second, that allows you to, if you have an API that uses OAuth 2, you can now sign in to your API using our interactive console. So imagine that you have an API that uses Active Directory for its authentication, and you want to provide an experience whereby developers who are going to come and learn how to use that API can try it out, but not only try it out, they can sign in as a user. I'll, I'll give you a quick, a quick glimpse of this in a few minutes. We added backup and restore so that you can um, have a DR story. Um, we added certificate authentication, so again, you can secure that high performance proxy to your back end and make sure no traffic is coming in around there. So we, we have some other options, but we added uh, mutual certs um, for that. 
We now support root APIs, which allows you to take full control of the namespace of, of the API. And we, added, we used to only support HTTPS. Some guys want HTTP, so we did that as well. Um, you can create many subscriptions now as a developer. I talked about subscription identifying um, the developer. Now you can do what they can have many apps. Each developer might generate 12 or so apps, so they can create a subscription per application. And we've made a, a massive um, uh, leaps in terms of improving performance of the developer portal. For those who aren't familiar with some of these concepts, I'll, I'll show you some of the, some of the solutions in a moment. Um, we're now in pretty much every Azure region. Uh, we are in 13. We just launched in the two Australian regions just uh, earlier this week. Um, another feature we added is called delegation. So the developer portal actually has a turnkey <laughs> identity experience for developers. So imagine the scenario is, that you have launched an API, you put it on programmable web, and you're trying to excite external developers about coming using your solution. In order to give them access to your API, you need to know who they are. And so they're gonna to need to create some kind of account with your system. You wanna support, depending on the type of solution you're building, you wanna support social identity, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, Twitter. Um, you probably also wanna support custom identity. So that allows them to just create an account. You know, I would never give my Facebook credentials to, I don't trust anyone with it because I'm scared they're gonna post something great in my wall. Um, but, so that allows you to create that, that identity. That's all built into this system. It's all completely built into API management. You don't need to do anything, it's turnkey. People can sign up, we have everything taken care of. We send emails, we have password reminders built in. If, however, you have your own identity system that you want to use, then you can use delegation to turn our stuff off and plug your things in, and then just integrate seamlessly with our developer portal. So that was a new feature that we released um, after uh, GA. Uh, we have a ton of caching improvements. So caching, if you're not familiar, because we have this proxy that sits between the API and the clients, we become a great caching solution. So we have turnkey caching. You click a, a checkbox, turn on caching for different operations, and we'll then use that to not only increase the performance, you know, make this thing faster by uh, feeding out, uh, out of our high performance cache, but we'll reduce the load on the back end. So we actually have a number of very large customers using this today to get a CDN-like behavior um, out of the API management solution. Um, we added Google Analytics support. A lot of our customers like using Google Analytics for their developer portal so they can understand what their customers are doing on the web experience that we offer as well. You can just plug that in. Um, I've put in HTTP support twice because it's so cool. Um, and, uh, and I think there was a cut and paste error here, actually, my apologies. And subscription prep was very cool as well, so we did that twice. Um, and API search. So now our developer portal is actually taking on a catalog like um, capability in terms of you can search the, um, you can search the APIs inside the, the developer portal. So I think I've got probably maybe five minutes left. Yeah, so I've got about seven minutes or so left, about 10 minutes maybe. Um, let me give you guys a very quick um, show and tell of the product in case you're not familiar. So API management is available in the Azure portal. So anyone can come and create an instance. We're now GA, it's no longer a preview service. Um, it's simple, new app services, API management create. Enter some details, specifically what you're entering there is a URL. That's going to be the URL of the, it's going to define the URL of both the development portal and the proxy. But the good news is, you want this to look like your brand. You want this to look like your business. So you can put custom C names in here and overwrite both the proxy URL and the developer portal URL. And we support SSL though, so you can upload your own SSL certificates as well. Um, I'm not going to do this, it, takes, you know, it can take up to 10 minutes, as we're actually provisioning VMs that we're deploying images uh, to, so you guys get dedicated hard work for the, for the solution here. So here's one that I created earlier um, called API Demo. And to get into the publisher portal, I just click this little manage button here, and that's gonna open up my API dashboard that gives me an at a glance view of, of what's going on inside um, my system. And if this was a busy system, which it isn't right now, we'd see um, some analytics here at a glance. Notice that over here I have some data on this um, uh, it's called Biz Web API, this particular example, and it tells me how many issues there are. So we actually, as part of the developer portal, which I'll show you in just a, a few minutes, um, we actually have an issues log that allows developers to communicate with you and tell you about issues they're having with their API. 
that you can then, this will go red. If there are any new issues in here, you can go in, you can respond to those, and we create a bi-directional channel for you to, to communicate with, um, with developers. Um, let me go in and show you really quickly just how easy it is to add and manage an API. So, so for the purposes of demo, what we have that we use is a very simple API that we just put out there on the internet called Calc API. It's a fantastic API. It can add two numbers. It's very effective. Anytime you want to add two numbers now, put your calculator away, get out a HTTP client, and you can curl and get the answer instead. Um, I'm thinking of turning this into a business. Uh, and we're going to call it Calculator Matron. And it's at this URL. So what I'm doing now is I'm telling the solution where the back end is. Where is the back end that I want to use for this particular app? It's calcapi.cloud.net. You guys can go play with this. It's, it's unprotected, actually. It's public. It's just there for fun. Um, and I want a suffix on my solution to be calc. Um, I can choose HTTP support. That feature that was so good I mentioned it twice. Um, here, if you want to support that, or you can just go for HTTPS. Uh, and I'm going to hit save. That'll create my API. And now what I'm going to do is add some operations. So the first operation I'm going to add is a get. Um, and normally, what the actual underlying API looks like is this. Uh, see, it's pretty small, actually, so I'll zoom in for you guys. It is slash API slash add query string um, A equals A and B equals B, right? So you can work out what's going to happen there. I'm going to add A and B, and it's going to give me the, the response. One of the cool things we can do, and I'm going to, I'm going to only have limited time, so I can only show you a real slice of the capabilities of the product at the moment. One of the cool things we can do is do on-the-fly rewriting of what the actual API looks like. So I've decided this, this isn't cool enough, this API, and I want it to look restful. If there are any kind of rest fleece in the room, um, don't be upset by what I'm about to do. I realize this isn't actually sort of I media is the engine of application state and all that, but still, it looks cool, doesn't it? Um, so what I'm doing is I'm going to change the way the API works. So on the front end, clients will see this new modern looking format, but on the back end, I still have this kind of old query string based format. And that's all I need to do to enable that. Um, let me zoom back out. I'm going to enter a name very quickly. I'll be very brief here because I only have a short amount of time. <coughs> I can enter a description. I can enter lots of metadata. This is the metadata that's going to generate the documentation for my developers. So I'll show you that in just a second. If this was an, a, res, a result, uh, sorry, a response I wanted to cache, this is how easy caching is. Enable cache. Done. I can set how long I want the time to live on this thing. I can configure whether it should vary by any headers or, or um, uh, query string parameters. And that's caching done. I'm not going to turn it on this time. I can document my parameters here. Again, this is all metadata. This is the first number. I'm not going to do the rest. Um, and then I can document my responses. So let's add a response. I'm going to document what a 200 OK response looks like. And I'm going to show, in this case, JSON. But I could add other representations. If I do content negotiation, I could show text and XML, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I will enter my example down here. This isn't the actual response, but it'll do for now. If what you're seeing here frightens you as being a lot of typing, you can import all this information using common um, formats like Waddle. Um, and Swagger, if you've heard of those, which are both common REST or HTTP API documentation formats. I can import all this. So I'm almost done for my very quick demo of the product. All I need to do now is publish my API. And to do that, I need to add it to a product. And what I want you to notice here is that products are basically grouping um, concepts. And notice that a product is also tied to groups. So I have administrators, developers, and guests. I can arbitrarily create groups here, as many as I want, and then assign developers into them which gives me an actual <coughs> control capability over both my developer portal and my API itself. For those of you that are curious, we will be more deeply integrating with Azure Active Directory here in the future so that you can pull in Active Directory concepts right into this place for your, for your internal API program. I need to add my product to, um, uh, to this particular solution, so I'm going to add my Calculator Matron API. And because that product is already published, Now, my API is live. So let me very quickly show you the develop portal. And I'm already signed in here as the administrator because I, I came from the, the publisher portal. But if a developer was to arrive here for the first time, he wouldn't be signed in. He'd see a sign in button here, or he could click this sign up button, at which point he'll be prompted, how would you like to create an account? You know, Google, Facebook, Twitter, et cetera, et cetera. Or would you like to create a custom account? Just give us your email address, and we'll verify your identity. 
Um, all very, very straightforward. Um, but I'm signed in as the administrator, so that saves me a little bit of time. Um, and I go to my APIs here, and I'll start to see the documentation that we entered. So notice here's, um, here's my APIs. I've got my calculator Matron API that we created. And as I go in, we start to see how that metadata is being used to actually generate this, this experience that shows you know, how to call this API. This is what it looks like. You would add more content than I did because you would add more time. It's very rich. All sorts of stuff you can do with it. Even better than that, based on that metadata that was entered, I can even generate code samples that show me how you would invoke this API from, for example, a Ruby backend. I didn't write that code. It was generated based on the metadata that we entered. And then I mentioned this earlier before. The console, my favorite feature, allows me to interact with the API in real time. So I can enter two numbers here. choose my subscription key, which identifies me as a developer. We support key rolling, so everyone gets two keys for every subscription, obviously. And I hit um, get. Oh, and I get a 503 service temporarily un unavailable. So I think that's coming from my actual calc API. That's interesting. OK. <laughs> this is why. Like, some time, like I wish I had my hour back that I lost. So, so I apologize for the demo break there. I'm not sure what's going on. It may be actually I misconfigured the API. I think you misspelled the URI when you were creating the service in Cloud App. I thought I saw an extra Let's see if we can fix it. Let's see if we can fix it. Very quickly. Carol's looking at me going, no, you haven't got time. <laughs> You're enjoying my fail. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> uh, in the API, right? So we think I entered it wrong. Let's see. Do, do, do settings, uh, calc API. What is that? <laughs> Thank you to the guy. Thank you to my new friend over there. Let's hope it works this time. So let me just refresh this so everything is nice and fresh. Uh, hit 76 and um, 3 and hit get. And we get 200 OK. And look, it successfully added those two numbers. So pretty impressive. But notice. Go on, right? I'm going to set up demo fails because it's a great way to get a clap, I tell you. Like, you recover from a fail. Um, uh, I didn't in this case, just to be clear. But notice it shows me all of the headers. Um, uh, it shows me you know, the response time, the response latency in this case, um, and, and the response down here. Now, um, we're, I'm over on time, so I want to bring it to a close. But I think I've given you a taste. Um, there's so much more to go and see about this. So go to azure.microsoft.com slash APIM and you'll, you'll um, be able to see much more. We also have a ton of videos that show you how you can do more. What I would normally do in a demo is show you in a matter of minutes, which I'm exhausted, how I can convert this to JSON, just literally configuring a, a little property, and also how I can rate limit this API. So if I hit it twice in, in five seconds, I start rejecting uh, the call and saying, no, you can't do it. We have built-in analytics that show you where the traffic's coming from, what the calls look like, whether your caching strategy is working, and much more. So I think I'll hand over to Kirill now um, and close up. But thank you very much for your time. If you want to